Okay, welcome everyone to class. Thank you, um, online students, for joining us. And welcome to our in person students. Nice to look at some faces when you're teaching. And also, uh, welcome to our e learning students who will be um, listening to the lectures later on. We'll begin. So, can I ask any one of you to please lead us in prayer? Anyone can lead us in prayer, please? Sister, Anyone can I pray? Yes, Sister Gertrude, thank you. Heavenly Father, we commit this time, Lord, today, whatever we are learning, my Master, Lord. Uh, Lord, reveal us through your word, my Master, what we are supposed to learn. Let the words be transformed in us, my Master, that we will be rooted in your word, my Master, and that we will be blessing to others through this word. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Gertrude. So we are looking at Chapter 6, okay, where we're studying the humanity of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, we discovered that Christ was fully human in all areas. And he willingly uh, restricted himself, or he willingly restricted himself to the limitations of a human being. Okay, and he was truly human in every sense, except that he was sinless. Yes, so we understood the importance of his inc incarnation, and we also looked at why was it necessary for Jesus to be become a human. We'll study more of it in chapter seven as well. But we were basically looking at various scripture passages that talk about the humanity of. Uh, Jesus and uh, we are looking at how uh, last class we ended by looking at how Jesus was a man who was approved by God and all the miracles he did he did because he was God right <laughs> yes sister Lucy in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of the Father he did the uh, miracles and healings okay so I said Jesus did all his miracles because he was deity, because he was God. No, sister. In mankind, he did. Yes. Thank you, Lucy. It's an, uh, really nice to have one, one student who listens and is attentive. And yeah, he did every all of the miracles, not because he was God, but he did everything because of him being he did all of his miracles in his human nature. In because He was completely human and he did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, he did it through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Remember we read Luke chapter 4 where Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach the good news, uh, to give sight to the blind to um, uh, release those in prison and those who are oppressed. Okay, so what is the meaning of anointing? The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you. So we, we looked at various scripture passages that show us that Jesus did his miracles uh, being human. Okay, and also within the limitations of his humanity. Okay, so uh, none of his attributes of him doing his miracles was attributed to him being deity, but him being completely human. Even Jesus said this, uh, uh, Jesus attributed uh, to casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. He did not say because he was omnipotent that he cast out the spirits, but he did it through the power of the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay, and we also looked at uh, references in John chapter 5, John chapter 10, where we saw that um, Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Okay, and um, uh, he pointed out to him being the Messiah by pointing out to his works, to doing the things that he had done in the Father's name. 
Okay, John chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, Jesus says, 25 basically he says, the works I do, I do in my Father's name and they testify about me. Okay, so we see that Jesus did all of the miracles being completely human. Why do you think Jesus did all of his this miracles being completely human? Why, even though he was fully God, if a deity as well, you know, why didn't he use his omnipotence to do the miracles? Can you please take the mic, Nelson? Thank you. To set an example for us so that we human beings also can do those things in human nature. Okay, to set us an example that him being completely human, he did all of these miracles, which means we too can do it. And when he said we can do greater things than what he has done, it also means that we can do it through our human nature. Okay. And did Jesus make provision for this? Did Jesus make a way for us to do the miracles that he did? Yes, sister. <laughs> okay. What is the, thank you, get through, that's the Lucy. Um, what, what is the way that, that he, uh, you know, what did he do for us so that we can do mighty science, miracles and wonders? He gave us the Holy Spirit. Yes, he gave us the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, remember the disciples, were the disciples able to do uh, powerful miracles like they did in Acts, the book of Acts that we read? You know, were they do, able to do it during their time with Jesus and post his... Uh, his death and resurrection till, you know, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Were they able to do those mighty signs, miracles and wonders, the, the disciples? What do you think? When they were with Jesus, just before his death, were they able to do those mighty signs, miracles and wonders like we see them doing after the Pentecost, when they were baptized? No, sister. No? Okay. But were they able to do some miracles? Yes, sister, they were able to do. Yes. Yes, they were able to do because Jesus sends them out in twos. They come back and say, hey, you know, they're so excited that even demons, you know, they they fall down and they uh, listen to them uh, when they speak the name of Jesus. And when he sends out the 70 elders, okay, uh, with whom he chooses, so he sends them two by two. They were able to do mighty, they were able to do miracles, but you know, remember the father who said, I brought my son to your disciples, but they were not able to cast out the demon and heal my son, okay? But do we see them doing greater miracles after the Pentecost? Yes, okay? So it was because of what Jesus had uh, done for them, we see that, you know, uh, in we read in John chapter, um, uh, John chapter 20, we read, uh, 20, well, John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22. Can somebody read that, please? John chapter, verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 21 and 22. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so when does this happen? When does this whole incident happen? When does this whole incident happen in John chapter 20? 20 years, when Jesus appears to his disciples. When Jesus appears to his disciples, when? The resurrection. After his resurrection. Okay. So what does he do? He he says, just as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Sending you to do what? Greater things, preach, teach, do signs, yeah. miracles, and wonders. Okay. And then he breathed upon them. And what does he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. Yes. Then look at what he says in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Can somebody read that? Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Okay. 
So Jesus is telling them, wait in Jerusalem till you are clothed with power from on high. Look at what he says in Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. Acts 1, 4 and 5. After being uh, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what is he telling the disciples to do in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5? What is he telling the disciples to do? To wait uh, patiently for the promise of the Father. Okay, to wait where? In Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? To send the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we see that in John chapter 20 verses 21 and 22, Jesus already breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Did they receive the Holy Spirit or not? Did they receive the Holy Spirit or not? Yes. And why is he telling them again in Luke chapter 24 verse 49 and Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 later on? Why is he saying, wait and you will be clothed with power from on high. The, 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 Father, the promise of the Father will come that is the Holy Spirit. Why is he telling them? And they've already received the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself, sister, Jesus himself was with the disciples. Okay. And here means in uh, John, John 20, 21 and 22. And then Acts, he was, he ascended into heaven and from there he anointed with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Anyone else? John baptized with water, but uh, the Father will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Okay. John baptized them uh, with water, but I will, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is concerning Luke 24, 49, Acts 1, 4, and 5. But my question is, when Jesus already breathed on, said, on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, why does he again say, wait, and you will receive the, you'll be clothed with power from on high. You learn this in the Holy Spirit class? Yes. What was this, this experience they had in John 20, 21, and 22? Sister, it was the um, baptism of the Holy Spirit. In which, sister, in John chapter 20? No, the uh, next one in uh, Acts and in uh, Luke. Okay, okay. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you, Sister Gertrude. You're right. What about John 20, 21 and 22? You learned this in Holy Spirit class? Very important. Okay, in John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, Jesus has just died, he's resurrected, he's coming and meeting the disciples, and that was their born-again experience when he breathes on them, says, receive the Holy Spirit, is their born-again experience. They could, could not have been born again because Jesus had not yet died for the sins of mankind. So when he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, it's the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. There are two things, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells. What is the meaning of indwells? Dwelling, living inside of you. So the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit is what? What does the Holy Spirit do as he dwells in you? Hello, what does the Holy Spirit do when he comes and dwells in you? He teaches you. Teaches you, okay. He teaches you. What else is the role of the Holy Spirit? Are you? He helps you, okay. Helps you. He's a comforter, helps us, guides us forever. Helps you, guides you, counsels you, teaches you. John chapter 14, John chapter 16, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come. He's a teacher, your counselor, your comforter. He's the one who guides you and uh, reminds you everything that I have taught you about. He will teach you and guide you into all truth. 
Okay, so yes, he's the spirit of all truth. He will guide you into all truth. He also prays for us. He comforts us. Thank you, Sanjay, Pratt, and Sam, Daniel, Matthews. So he does all of these things. Okay, so that is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also sanctifies us. Okay, makes us more Christ-like. Also helps us to bear the fruit of the Spirit. All depends on how much we allow him to work in our lives. Okay, so that is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us when we are born again, what is the infilling power of the Holy Spirit? What? When does that happen? The infilling, you didn't learn all this. You're looking so confused at me. <laughs> <We're> like... <laughs> Huh? That is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit when you accept the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. When is the infilling power of the Holy Spirit? When do you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The baptism. The baptism, yeah, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is why Jesus breathes on them. John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, that is their born again experience when the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, 49 and Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, when Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem, you will be clothed or endued with power or empowered with the Holy Spirit, or you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What happens when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit? Sister, you get the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yes, your in, the in, it's called the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's why Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So it is power to be his witnesses okay so we see that jesus you know makes provision for us to do the same signs miracles and wonders uh, jesus knew that he did all of the signs miracles and wonders to the empowering of the holy spirit and it's the holy spirit that em enabled jesus to do all the miracles he did and before he ascended to the father he sent us the holy spirit who would empower us to do the miracle, miraculous works that he himself did. Okay, and we also saw how the disciples attributed or testified that Jesus did all of the signs, miracles, and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think we read this verse last week. Did we read it? Acts ten thirty eight. Very important verse. Please, somebody can read that, please. How the disciples testified and attributed the healing works of Jesus to the power of the Holy Spirit. Can somebody please read Acts 10, 38, please? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and, the, and with the power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Amen. Thank you. So it was God who anointed Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And because of that, he went around doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil. So it is very important to make note of this, that Jesus did all of the signs, miracles, and wonders by being completely human, because he refrained from using his nature of being omnipotent. He did it all in the, in the fullness of being human. He did all the signs, miracles, and wonders. Any questions, any doubts? Before we move sister, on. I have a question. Yes, Sister Gertrude. Uh, the like for for us for human beings, when we are born again, we get baptized with water. But is it possible to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time? Uh, you mean the same time when you are baptized and you take water baptism? Yeah. Yeah, why not when you desire that? It's actually Paul says desire. You know, uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that you desire, something that is a gift from God, which is given to you. And he, you know, you can, um, uh, you can even receive it. Uh, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. At that time, you can pray about it. 
And then when you say, God, I'm going to be baptized in the water, the same time I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you receive knowledge and understanding about what the baptism of the of water is, what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, yes, you can um, uh, you can also be baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus, he received, uh, he was baptized. Sister, Jesus was baptized by uh, uh, Apostle John with baptism of water at the same time he received the baptism of the holy spirit right uh yes maybe we can say that he because after that he went to the wilderness and you know and he came out and then he he went into galilee and did mighty signs miracles and wonders yes heavens opened and you know um so when we when we are baptized in the water we it's a powerful uh, proclamation of um, you know the finished work of the cross so we can uh, we can you know um, we can expect the finished work of the cross uh, to be administered to us when we are water baptized uh, there was no specific time when jesus was uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, so we can say yes. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, he uh, after that went about doing mighty signs, uh, miracles, and wonders. Yes. So it's Thank basically you, if you desire that, and you want it. You can pray, and you can just uh, wait on the Lord, and He can just baptize you. Uh, I'm asking this question because not many churches teach you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, is, uh, at least uh, my personal experience, you know, only till now I realize I've come to learn through these classes that, you know, that we have to uh, also receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be a complete, you know, to do the work of the Lord. Yeah, to be a, uh, to be a minister, yes, you yes. can, and to flow in the gifts and do signs, miracles, yes, and yes. Yeah, your preaching yes, yes, yes. can be attested by signs, miracles, and uh, wonders. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sister. Yes. So, uh, I don't know if this, this, I don't know if this has already been addressed, but how do you actually be baptized by the Holy Spirit? Is it something that I seek God and I pray and wait for? Uh, thing, especially when you're specifying indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. So, is it? Uh, can you just throw some light on it? Okay, so indwelling power of the Holy Spirit is something that God wants all of us to have so that we can be effective witnesses, preach His word, and also flow in signs, miracles, and wonders because people um, are not just looking to hear, but also they're, you know, looking to uh, experience in a tangible way the, the presence and the power of God, and that is through signs, miracles, and wonders. And uh, He, God, wants us to you know, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we can be effective uh, ministers. So what we can do is just desire for it, okay? So you mean to say like, I pray about it and I just wait upon, uh, I mean, you know, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I have the Holy Spirit within me. So how is it that I get baptized with the Holy Spirit? So you're, uh, uh, you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? How do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You just pray and desire. So I had a, a live-in maid who is from uh, from Chhattisgarh, uh, and she was is from a non-Christian background, and um, she came into you know, she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and she got connected with the with the church there, and she desired so much to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So because of the lack of the knowledge of the church about you know water baptism. Uh, Holy Spirit baptism, they told her that, hey, you're a new believer. Uh, you've not even been baptized in the water. And we won't baptize you in the water now because you, you have to wait three months. Only then we'll baptize you in the water. After you're baptized in the water, then you'll have to wait for some more time. Then we'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit. But she was so eager for you know, to uh, for to be baptized, the Holy Spirit, to speak in tongues, to flow in the gifts. So she just started praying at home. And, you know, she um, doesn't know much of the Bible, but she loves the Bible. She reads it. So one night she was telling me at 11 o'clock when she's reading the Bible and praying, she just started speaking in tongues, you know, and she just kept speaking in tongues. So after her prayer, everything, when her mother was asking her some question, 
uh, and she has to speak and answer her she's just speaking in tongues so every time she's opening her mouth she's just speaking in tongues it happened till in the morning the morning was a my woke up thought she'll be all right speaking to her she's when she's trying to open her mouth and answer her mother she's just speaking in tongues mother thought that the shaitan pakad liya hai usko you know <laughs> thought that you know she, she's possessed because you know there's so much dominance of the evil one in in champa and in chatisgarh and they were all under the demonic uh, attack and all of that so she the mother ran to the pastor and said you know this is what uh, she's doing the uh, the pastor said no she's actually speaking in tongue she's baptized in the holy spirit and everybody in the church say how can it happen to you you're not even baptized in the water you're a new believer but she is saying didi i just prayed you know i just desired it i asked god and he gave it to me he's a loving god he doesn't you know it says uh, jesus says when a when a when a when a son or a daughter asks you for fish will you give them a snake when you when you ask them for bread will give you uh, will you give them a stone then when you know how much more your heavenly father will give the holy spirit for those you ask so all you need to do is you need to just ask you don't have to go for baptism in the holy spirit class you can just pray wherever you are desire it and just open your mouth and just don't speak in in the language that you usually speak or say praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah uh, just open your mouth and say god just give me speak to me tongues at let me utter the tongues so sometimes it can be just like stammering so when i started speaking in tongues was my my lips were just moving my tongue was just stuttering but then i just started speaking it about she kidding the later on you know slowly you grow in speaking the tongues it just edifies you strengthens you and then you look for opportunities where you can flow in the gifts so uh, you, i can conclude that you know uh, when you pray for the baptism of the holy spirit is it when i receive the gifts of the holy spirit or is it uh, also with the fruits of the spirit how do i know that i am baptized with the holy how spirit how do you know one of the signs is there are speaking? basically in acts you have about eight instances when uh, records about the baptism of the holy spirit um, and i think more uh, all i think five of them uh, or seven of them i think seven instances and then five where where they were spoken tongues like um, like um, the pen on day of pentecost um also you know um uh, when when uh, peter goes to cornelius's house he's just speaking the message and they were all cut to their heart and they all start speaking in tongues how do they know that they are baptized in the holy spirit without peter even praying for the gentiles to be baptized in the holy spirit they start speaking in tongues so that's how they know so the outward sign for what we see as a pattern in the book of acts is basically that all of them you know first spoke in tongues even even paul it was not mentioned when ananias came and the son but you know paul says later on i speak in tongues more than anybody uh, else okay so that is the first sign but when when uh, i think peter goes or paul goes to ephesus and he prays for the them for the baptism of the holy spirit they also prophesy which is one of the gifts of the spirit so it's not necessary that you have to just speak in tongues but the main outward sign which is one of the gifts of the spirit is speaking in tongues but also there were some in one instance when they prophesied you can also um, you know uh, uh, you can also uh, speak words of wisdom and knowledge so basically you will flow in the gifts of the spirit uh, the the fruit of the spirit is the indwelling work of the holy spirit the when you are when you are uh, accept jesus when the holy spirit comes and dwells in you he makes you more christ like and that is the nature of christ is seen through you that is the fruit of the holy spirit the gifts of the holy spirit is when you are baptized in the holy spirit is that uh, useful okay thank you uh, sanjay has a question did jesus perform any miracles before john um the baptized uh, baptized him so in the new testament accounts there is no mention of jesus performing any miracles before the baptism uh, by john the baptist uh, but the gospels generally depict uh, jesus public ministry uh, of him doing miracles uh, beginning after his uh, baptism so when jesus was baptized the river jordan matthew chapter 3 we see that immediately after this event the spirit of god came upon him descended upon him and he began his ministry and um, we see that you know uh, john the baptist records sorry john the apostle records the first miracle at the wedding in cana which occurred after his 
baptism, which is uh, John chapter 2, verses uh, 1 to 11 that we read. So uh, based on the biblical narratives, uh, Jesus' miracles basically started or commenced following his uh, baptism by John the Baptist. Did that help, Sanjay? Okay, thank you. Esther Clement says, invariably, does it always imply that speaking in tongues is evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Not necessary. Uh, it's not that we have to speak in tongues, that is the evidence. But what we look at the biblical pattern, what we learn from Acts is the first time they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, out of the instances that are there, you know, um, all of them spoke in uh, tongues. But of course, I told you one instance when they uh, also prophesied. So, and that, that is also a gift of the Spirit, but we also encourage others to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. For some of them, when we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they don't speak immediately in tongues at that moment. I know of one person who was uh, testifying saying that one week later, when he was going on his bike to work, uh, he was just praising God. He just started speaking in tongues. But it was one week prior that he was prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, And it was one week almost later after that when he was on the bike on the road that he started speaking in tongues. So you just believe you're baptized and then you just wait for to speak in tongues. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, we move from Christology class to pneumatology class. <laughs> Okay, okay, fine. Uh, we'll uh, go back to Christology. We're looking at the humanity of Jesus Christ. Okay, and we look at the days of his flesh, uh, very beautifully given to us in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. Can somebody read Hebrews 5, 7 to 9, please? Can I read, sister? Sure, sister Gertrude. Uh, Hebrews 5, 7 to 9 who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up praise and supplication with the vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save from the death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. So here we see that numerous references of the humanity of Christ or the humanness of Christ, which is talking about the days in his flesh. So we see that when he was in his flesh, Jesus prayed, right? Um, verse 7, the first part, he offered up prayers and supplications. We also see that Jesus wept, okay? We see that uh, with he cried, uh, you see, sorry, he prayed and made supplications with vehement cries and tears. Okay, verse eight, we see that he had godly fear. What does it mean? He had godly fear. What he is about to endure, the pain and suffering. What uh, he is going to endure? Endure it is not the fear from God, but. Uh, the uh, fear of God, you say? No, 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 no. It's not the fear of God. It's directly. In, it's he's implies he's uh, basically referring to what he's about to endure. So what he's the, going to endure on the through cross? the human persecution and that. Through persecution, uh, yeah. okay, crucifixion, okay. Uh, godly fear basically means reverence, reverence to God. He basically had Jesus revered the Father. He had reverence towards the. Father. Reverence means what? Uh, simple, uh, sorry, it's in a small g, you know, so I was a little confused. Sorry, well, the godly, godly fear. fear. Small g, so I was a little confused. Yeah, but it's okay. I okay, mean, it's not... yeah. Godly fear is when we talk about, you know, we have we should have godly fear, it's basically we are talking about having reverence to God. Okay, honoring God. Okay. Verse 8 again, he learned obedience, okay, which means he was taught by the Father and he was obedient to doing the Father's will. Uh, verse 8 talks about his suffering, that he went through suffering, he went through great pain and anguish. And verse 9, having been perfected, that means Jesus had to 
prove himself to be qualified as the author of our salvation. Okay, so even Jesus had to stand the test and the trials that he had to go through, and he had to prove himself uh, to be qualified to be the author of our salvation. Okay, so if you want to, one scripture reference that talks about Jesus' days in the flesh is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. Okay, so we see him being uh, totally human in reality, he was fully human. He demonstrated his humanness even as he walked in submission to the Father. And he did this all also as an example to model for us. And um, uh, that is what even uh, the apostles caught. Okay, they, they knew that Jesus was teaching them modeling through his very life. Look at what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Oh, Lucy, thank you. Your respect to God you had written. I miss seeing that. Thank you, Lucy. Can somebody read 1 Peter 2, 21, please? 1 Peter 2. Okay, please go ahead, brother. No, go ahead, brother. Sanjay. Go ahead. Go ahead. First uh, Peter 2 verse 21, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Amen. Thank you. So here we see uh, the Apostle Peter saying that Christ suffered and he did that so that he can leave us an example so that we can follow in his steps. Okay. And another amazing thing about Jesus' humanity is that even as he was a man, you know, he will come back and he is a man who will judge the world. Okay? Look at what Acts 17, 30 and 31 says. Can somebody else read it? Somebody from the online class, can somebody read Acts 17, 30 and 31, please? Cyril, would you like to read Acts 17, 30, and 31? Okay. Acts 17, 30, 30, and 31. Truly, this time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repeat, repeat, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained he has given assurance of the of this to all by raising him from the death amen thank you cyril good to hear your voice miss you in the in person class and all the help that you used to offer in setting up the class thank you ma'am thank you so here we see that uh, you know the salvation is promised through the man Christ Jesus, okay, not only salvation to the man Christ Jesus, but judgment of the world will also be executed by the man Christ Jesus, okay, and judgment is interesting to see here that we will be judged by someone who actually lived like us humans, who walked as a human being, who went through what it is to be a human was fully human and such a person will also judge us so that's very interesting and in how god has ordained things that even as you know one thing about incarnation is also that you know the same god who became man would also be the one who would judge us he would be able to understand us and judge us in righteousness and in justice yes so we basically looked at um, the fullness of that Jesus was fully human and various scripture passages that talk about his humanity. Any questions in chapter 6? Any doubts, anything that um, you want me to explain again? Okay, I'll take the silence for a no. That all of you have understood everything very well. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to chapter seven. 
the purpose of the incarnation. Okay, we basically looked at the what of the incarnation, what God taking on human form. We examined the humanity of Christ, and now we will summarize the why of the incarnation. Okay, uh, what was the purpose of the incarnation? Why did Christ have to become a man to take on the fullness of humanity? Uh, and what was God doing through humanity that Christ, uh, uh, what was God doing through the humanity of Christ that he could not do by any other means? So in this chapter, we'll attempt, try to attempt to answer these questions. Of course, we will look at various scripture passages and we will study them. Um, most of the, the first few scripture passages that we'll be studying are passages that we already looked at, we studied. So we will not be looking at it in detail because uh, we've already studied that. We will just reiterate the points and we will move on. But in this chapter, we will be basically be studying, uh, you know, what was the purpose of the incarnation? Why did Christ have to become a man and take on the fullness of humanity? What was God doing through humanity that he could not do through any other means? Okay. So we look at uh, why Christ had to become a man. Why did he have to take on the fullness of in humanity? What was the pur uh, uh, purpose of incarnation? So the first thing we look at was that, you know, uh, God through Jesus Christ was revealing himself and was speaking through um, uh, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was the full final revelation of God himself. So we look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Can somebody read that, please? Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Amen. Thank you. So here, what does it say? God spoke through whom in the past? Prophets. Okay. Prophets. And he, yes, he communicated to the people, uh, the, to, he communicated through the prophets his words. What he wanted to tell the people, he spoke to the prophets, and the prophets communicated the word of uh, the Lord to the, the people. And when the appointed time came, the fullness of time, the Kairos time came, you know, God sent his son, he sent the word, and through him, he communicated everything that he wanted to communicate to man. So everything that he wanted to tell us is revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the incarnation of Jesus is God's final and complete word to man. So there's no more revelation that is needed. Everything that God wanted to communicate to us is there in the Bible. Okay, so that is why it says nothing can be added, nothing can be removed. It's a full, complete revelation, and Jesus Christ, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, is the full, complete revelation of God himself. So in the incarnation, why did God become man? One of the reasons is so that through the incarnation, it was God speaking to man through the man, Jesus Christ. It was God revealing himself to man through Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, in your notes, there is a quote given. Can somebody read that quote, please, in your notes? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Yeah, go ahead. Go yes, yes. Jesus Christ is a self-manifestation of God, the final culmination of all the acts of revelation of the old covenant, and their fulfillment, the highest personal peculiar word of God. Thank you. So what do we understand from this quote? What do we understand from this quote? We've, we've studied quite a bit, so I'm sure you can answer. Okay, can you give him the mic, please? A father showing his nature, uh, love carrying through Jesus Christ. Okay, Father, God revealing himself through Jesus Christ. Okay, what else?
He is the exact image of God the Father. Okay, he is the exact representation, the image of God the Father. Okay, yes, Lucy? Nature and attributes of the Father we have seen through Jesus Christ. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the prophecy being fulfilled is all of the prophecies uh, were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All the prophecies that were spoken fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Did you even know that the Old Testament sacrifices that God had instituted were also pointing to Jesus Christ? Did you know that? Repeat that. All of the Old Testament sacrifices that Jesus had, God had instituted, sorry, were all pointing out to the work of the sacrifice that Jesus would make. Interesting, right? We'll study about that uh, in, the, uh, in the, the few chapters that we will go through. Okay, so all the sacrifices, the covenants, everything, the prophecies were all seen, their fulfillment in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Anything else? So what we understand from this quote is basically that Jesus is the image of God's person. Okay, Jesus is the perfect and complete copy or representation of God. We looked at all the verses, Philippians, Colossians and all of that. We studied Hebrews. Is, uh, Jesus is a perfect and complete copy or representation of God, the nature of God and who God really is like. So in the incarnation, we have the complete revelation of the living God. And now, uh, and, and because of what Jesus has done and revealed to us through, his, through his, uh, his attributes, his work, the person that he was, and the things that he did, okay, uh, we are able to now understand and know God fully. Okay? So it is Jesus Christ, or it is the Word of God, Jesus, who is the Word, who became the became flesh. It is through the word of God, it is through uh, Jesus Christ that God revealed himself to man and it was the word who became God, who manifested God to us in a real way that we can see and understand. Okay, And also this quote says that the acts and the revelation of God in the Old Testament are completed and fulfilled in the highest and in the personal way in Jesus Christ. All of the acts, okay, all of the revelation of God in the Old Testament is completed and fulfilled in the highest and personal way in Jesus Christ. Okay, we'll stop here. It's time. Any questions? Anyone here has? Any questions? Any doubts? Anything you all want me to clarify? Okay, if not, we will end class here. Thank you all for uh, joining class. Have a blessed day.